It's a huge, beautiful mountain, and it rises up right out of the desert floor to a height of over 10,000 feet. It definitely dominates the landscape. Now, most of us see it as we're driving the 10 freeway on the way to Palm Springs and other desert cities. Mount San Jacinto is a landmark. It's also the location of two spectacular engineering feats, marvels that are recognized by engineering professionals around the world. And if you're curious as to what these two projects are and why they're so remarkable, well, all you have to do is come on along with us as we continue our search together, this time on Mount San Jacinto for California's gold. Well, there we were getting a bird's eye helicopter view of this beautiful mountain. Lots of snow up there. And in fact, the top of the mountain is where we were heading. But we were a little out of sequence because before we could go to the top, we had to go back down to the bottom. The early morning desert sun casting a glow on the big old mountain as we headed for the first engineering marvel. Now this is one that's pretty well known because it's been used by over five million people since it opened in 1963. We're talking about the Palm Springs Aerial Tramway. Constructed in a rugged canyon, the tram takes passengers almost straight up the side of the mountain, literally going from the hot desert to the snow country. Now this whole thing was the dream of Francis Crocker, who pushed for its construction for almost 30 years before he finally saw his dream come true. A dream that's been designated an historical civil engineering landmark. Now, before we started, you wanted to show me this model, and this is... This is the mountain. This, this is, is the mountain. That's right, and you are down here, okay, right about in here right now, and we're gonna go right there. Now that is amazing to me because it looks like we're going almost straight up. This is like a sheer face Correct. of the mountain. Correct. This San Jacinto is the sheerest faced mountain in North America. And this model was made for us by Desert Museum. Uh, we had a display there last year on, on the history of the mountain. And they didn't want the mountain model after, so I got it. <laughs> <laughs> but it looks interesting because this is the yes. sheer face yes. over here. Over here right. is kind of the gentle, gentle sloping Much face. gentle sloping on the other side. So, it's farmland and stuff and hemet on the other side of the mountain. It all goes down into cows and pastures. So why would they build a tram going up? That looks like the most difficult because Francis wanted to have a great view when he got to the top. I got you, and that's the view right there. That's the view. As you go up, the temperature's gonna get chillier. Can you feel it? Yeah, oh yeah. <laughs> it's really getting chilly. Um, Look at this. Yeah, this see? Is... And everything's gonna change. You left the desert with brush and sand, and now you're turning, hold on. Oh, wow. That's only one. We got four more to go, and you that know, wasn't bad. I never had even thought about the sense of being a little bit nervous about this. I mean, not that it's unsafe, but just the sense of being, you're literally just hanging out over the... Yeah, canyon. Yeah. I mean, here you are, and down there is, you know, rocks and trees and water, and but you gotta think about, think about 100, 200 years ago. This canyon was the summer home of the Agua Caliente Indians. Every summer, the Indians would walk up here. There's springs here, there's waterfalls. Down in here, down in there. Floor, you can see this is where the springs would have been, down here. Oh, look. And then looking up, we've got the window down, Louis, so you can get a nice shot right through the open window. How did they ever build this thing? Major construction was done with the use of helicopters. As I said, the Valley Station and the first tower were the only ones reachable by road. Everything else, 
they flew up with helicopters they flew twenty three thousand missions in twenty six months to build the to build the tramway so they were all of these big towers up here were were built with helicopters with helicopters as we go past tower number two you can see a one of the pads still up there on the rock oh, to the off left to the left right over there louis you can see it kind of perched out on the on the rock that's where they would land yes we still use those pads for uh maintenance work in the summer so they're still used but it was a magnificent feat. I mean, it was, nobody believed it could be done. They truly didn't. I mean, you know, in the 1960s, uh, early 60s, when construction started, who thought that, you know, in 26 months this would happen? The Swiss experts had said it would take them three years to build, and there'd be two lives lost. There were no accidents, and it took them 26 months. Were there people who said it couldn't be done? Oh, heaven, yes. There were lots of people who said it couldn't be done. Francis was called every name in the book. Some not very kind in those days. Uh, some not very kind today. You know, but he persevered for, for years and years. His only supporter was his wife. And Rosalie would smile and nod and go, Francis wants this. It'll happen. And it did. And we are eternally grateful. What you looking at out here? Oh, it's... It's impressive. I can't believe uh, how rugged the mountains are like this, rising out of the desert floor. Have you ever been on this tram? No, I haven't. This really? is my first time, and I'm really impressed. What did you expect? I wasn't sure. Uh, I can't believe going from one land mass to the other in such a short period of time. Yeah. Just the difference is truly amazing. Yeah, because we're in the snow country yeah. now. Down there on the desert floor yesterday, I was in the swimming pool, you know, getting a sunburn. And, uh, <laughs> it's great. I, I love it. 38 it's 38 degrees. And there we go, looking down at the, this is where we've just come from, looking down onto the valley floor. There's Palm Springs down there. We've come a long way up. <laughs> Breezy, isn't it? Nippy? A little oh cold? Oh my gosh. <laughs> it's a little chilly. This is amazing. This is a little chilly. Isn't this great? Now, this is like being in another this world. Is, this is another world, completely in another world. On this side, you are in a state park with pine trees, with rugged wilderness, with snow. With cold with, air. Well, yes, with cold air. It's, it's about 38. On this side, I think it's a little chillier because the breeze is blowing. Wow. Something, huh? Ladies, you're wearing shorts. <laughs> yes, we are. <laughs> Did you know it was going to be like this up here? Well, actually, she's been before, uh -huh. so she kind of warned us. So you've been before. Yeah, you're I wearing jeans. Pants, right? You brought them along, yeah. and your legs are getting a little, a little pink. pink. Yeah, it's a little pink. Yeah. But it's, it's amazing that Beautiful. the desert is just right down there. Yes, it is. It and is by amazing. By the time we get down there, it'll be 80 degrees. Yeah. So, <laughs> and yeah. you guys will be hot because you're in pants. <laughs> Absolutely incredible. Had you ever been up the tram before? No, I've backpacked this area my entire life, and uh, Friday was the first time I've actually come up the tram. So, what do you think about the tram? Get a pass and come up all year long because it's it's totally worth it. It's yeah. incredible. What a ride. You noticed coming up the tram what a contrast it was from Palm Springs where they had 83 degree temperatures uh, yesterday and up here where the lows last night were in the low 20s. Some people are real prepared, uh, Boy Scout groups, uh, hiking groups, they tend to be well prepared and come up with snowshoes and equipment. But we also see a lot of people from Palm Springs coming up with short skirts and stiletto heels. We call those <laughs> one point crampons. <laughs> You're kidding. They really come up that yeah. unprepared. They keep us fairly busy in the wintertime. We have uh, we can run as many as five emergency calls a day with people who are unprepared. So people just get up here and don't realize what they've gotten themselves into. Sitting at the pool in Palm Springs looking up at the mountain, a lot of people have no idea. What's amazing up here is that the tram in such a short span of minutes literally brings you from one ecosystem to another. You actually travel through uh, four different ecosystems to get to where you're standing. It's like driving almost a thousand miles north. Um, that same change would take place. Four ecosystems during the tram ride? You bet. You go from the lower Sonoran Desert right up here to the, uh, the edge of the Arctic Fringe and the Coniferous Forest. This is the edge 
of the Arctic Fringe? Not quite the edge of the Arctic Fringe. You go up to the uh, summit, and that's where tree line is, and that's where you get to the edge of that. Because this, this really does, this looks like something from Northern California. This environment is very, very similar to the Sierra Nevada mountains, uh, with the kind of trees and the animals that you'd find there. So is the, is the idea of the tram bringing people up through that many ecosystems that quickly, it's really kind of unique anywhere, isn't it? It's, as far as I know, it's unique anywhere in the United States. Um, this mountain is very precipitous. It gains a lot of altitude very quickly. Uh, we're surrounded by faults, and this mountain was literally pushed straight up in the air. So there's no other place in the United States that you can start in the desert, get on a tram and ride for 12 minutes, and be almost on the Arctic fringe. That's exactly correct. Now we had a great time on top of Mount San Jacinto, but in order to continue our adventure, we had to leave all that snow and go back down to the desert. We were heading for the site of the second engineering marvel connected with the mountain, an obscure and little known connection that involves water and California history. Back in the 1930s, the Metropolitan Water District constructed a 242-mile aqueduct across the Mojave Desert, an aqueduct that brought water from the Colorado River to supply cities and towns throughout Southern California. It was a huge engineering project, bringing all that water all that distance, especially when you consider what the engineers had to do when the aqueduct reached Mount San Jacinto because, believe it or not, they decided to dig a tunnel through the mountain, a 13-mile tunnel through solid rock. On normal days, over one billion gallons of water pass through this tunnel. But every five or six years, the MWD people shut it off and inspect the tunnel. We were invited to come along on this inspection trip, and there was excitement in the air as we set out to explore this wonderful, seldom seen part of Mount San Jacinto. Well, we are actually going down into a place that really most people don't even know exists. Hugh, I would guess that over the past 50 years there have been fewer than 500 people that have had an opportunity to go into this tunnel and, and see it. And it is literally right under the mountain. There's the mountain right up there. That, it's a 13-mile tunnel that goes right under the uh, northern edge of Mount San Jacinto. Now, this has been here, this entrance has been here since the 30s? This uh, was uh, built in 1932, and uh, the, the entrance itself, the tunnel itself, was about a six-year construction project from 1933 to 1939. Oh, wow, look at this. <laughs> this is wonderful. And it was wonderful. I mean, this was exciting. We loaded up on a little tractor-pulled wagon for what turned out to be a three-hour adventure inside the mountain, a mountain that was full of surprises. Oh, you can actually see on the side of the tunnel where the water has left its mark. That's right, and you can see up at the top there the two tracks, and that would be as high as it ever got. So even at its highest flow, you've still got a couple of inches of air at the top of the tunnel. I got you. Now, is this all we're going to see? Or are we just going to be driving through something like this for 13 miles? It, you're, it, well, it's going to look like this for 13 miles, yes. <laughs> but there are, there are some features. Once we get a little deeper inside the tunnel, uh, it goes up, it comes down. There are some construction edits off to the left and to the right. Uh, we also need to watch for stalactites, uh, which is uh, calcium carbonate, which is uh, come in and formed on the roof of the tunnel here. It's also going to get real wet. We're at the low end of the tunnel, keep that in mind. And as we move through it and get closer to the Hemet side of Mount San Jacinto, we are going to see more water. And you will see some of the areas where the original miners back in the 30s had to tunnel into this tunnel from the side and from the top in order to complete construction of this tunnel. Okay, our first stop, and this is a significant one. This water is really part of the story of this tunnel. 
Yes, it is. Uh, you'll, what we have here, what you see is groundwater that started out as rain and snow melt on top of Mount San Jacinto. It's worked this, which is about 10,000 feet above us. It's worked its way all the way down to the tunnel. And the pressure, obviously, outside the tunnel is greater than it is inside the tunnel, and the, and the water enters the tunnel. This is a relatively small uh, intrusion. We're going to see a lot more water than this a little further on down the stream. We're about uh, three miles into the tunnel at this stage of the game. So this is all groundwater from the mountain above us. That's correct. you got a lot of water here. Yeah, you'll see. Sir? Asiatic clams in here come from the river. you got clams in here? Well, these are, this is from the Colorado River because that's the origin of the water, and they have these small Asiatic clams that are, that, uh, are on the river, and they're really a, a pain in the neck for us to deal with, uh, but you'll see them scattered throughout here. They show up at our treatment plants, and we have to pull them out. So these, this little clam has come all the way from the Colorado River. That's right. He's made, uh, we're about uh, roughly 220 uh, aqueduct miles from the river, and this little clam made that trip. And look, there are a lot of little clams in here. Look at that. This part of the trip always reminds me of uh, canoeing down a serene stream. And off in the far, far distance, you hear this muffled roar. And as you continue going down the stream, it gets louder and louder. You go, what the heck is that? And you don't realize until you're on top of it that it's a waterfall. And that's exactly where we're headed. Oh, boy, here's the sound. This is a uh, major incursion into the tunnel of water. We're about uh, 30, 40 yards away from it. And we've got a, it looks like a fire hose when you get up there. And it's coming out at about 180 pounds uh, pressure, pounds per square inch pressure. So look at this thing. It's just shooting across the tunnel. Not only that, it's been doing this for 50 years. Oh my gosh. If you were to get hit by that water, it'd knock you over. Oh, actually, you can put your hand in it. Come here. It, it would knock you over, though. And now we're going to what they call the car wash. What are we going to see, Jane? I didn't hear you. This is the car wash down here? This is the car wash we're coming to. That'll be the next big area where we've got that kind of water, that amount of water coming into the tunnel. Well, let's stand here and talk about this for a minute. This water is what the fellows who made this tunnel kept coming up against all the time. Absolutely, Hugh. And the nice thing right now is because we've got an engineered tunnel, we've got concrete, we can control it somewhat. But remember, when the hard rock miners were coming through here, all they had was raw rock. So when, when they hit water unexpectedly, they could have flows of up to uh, 15,000 gallons a minute. Uh, one of them that I recall was over 40,000 gallons a minute. They hit a spring and it just exploded. So the idea would be that when these guys were down here drilling, they never knew when they were going to hit one of these big, uh, what do you call them? Yeah, call it a geyser, call it a spring. Essentially, they would do surveys and they would do drilling to find out where the groundwater was, but that wasn't very precise. So they knew where some of it was, but every once in a while, they'd hit a pocket like this that was completely unknown to them. We had one event where we had 40 or 50 uh, miners working here in the tunnel, and fortunately, they were near an 800-foot vertical uh, tube that went up to the outside. As they mined through, they hit one of these springs, and the tunnel began filling up very rapidly with water. Those 40 guys scrambled out of here. Now, remember, 800 feet above this, the last guy out had water up to his waist as he got out at the top of the tunnel. Well, the water was rising that fast. At, at, at 40,000 gallons a minute, it was rising very rapidly. Wow. Well, let's go down here. We've got about a, between 120 and 130 pounds per square inch coming out here. But there's no way around it. You've got to walk through it. How are we going to get our camera through there? I, we, hopefully, we've got enough plastic bags that we're going to be OK. But uh, as you can tell, 
the, from the people walking there now, you're going to get wet. There's no look, two ways about it. Look at this. This is amazing. And this has been coming up like this since the tunnel was initially built. Yeah, it's been coming up like this for 50 or 60 years. But imagine, if you will, that you're a hard rock miner. You're a hard rock miner. All you have is a wall of rock in front of you. You've dug about four miles this way or so from the last adit, and you're blasting and digging and mucking, and there are about 30 of you in here working, and all of a sudden, boom, you punch through a, a solid part of the granite mountain, and this water just comes gushing out at you. It, it had to be a frightening event. So the miners never knew when they were digging when they were going to hit something like this, and it was just going to come shooting out like this. That's exactly right. They knew where some of it was, but they didn't know where all of it was. And look, we're standing way above ankle deep in this water right now. And this is, since the water is cut off coming in here, every bit of this water is spring water that's come in this tunnel. That's right. We've got the Colorado River Aqueduct, which normally feeds this tunnel. That's shut off about 70 miles north of here. So it's dry. There's nothing coming into this tunnel other than the natural water that you see uh, coming in here. Wow. Pretty good flow. This is pro this is uh, maybe uh, 500,000 gallons a day right here. And the last one we saw was uh, probably more like a, a million. A lot of water comes into this tunnel just from the, uh, the groundwater traveling its way down Mount San Jacinto. Now, wait a minute. How are we going to get through? Can we carry this through? This is okay. All right, I'm going to let you carry that. I'm going to put the mic up underneath my coat. And, Louie, we're just going to run through. We'll see you later because Louie's going to have to wrap his camera in a hefty bag and try to get it through. Our camera does not like water. I can understand that. All right. Good here, luck, Louie. Here we go. <laughs> Okay, we're on the other side, Louie. Wrap it up and come on through. <laughs> Why did they come through the mountain instead of going around it? That's a good question. <laughs> uh, the answer, actually, when you think about it, is pretty obvious. When you're moving large quantities of water, and this tunnel can carry uh, a little over a billion gallons of water a day, you want to have to pump that water as little as possible be because pumping takes energy. And what that means is that you want to follow the contour of the land as best you can. So any other way around this mountain would have required pumping. So by them tunneling through the mountain and leaving a nice even hydraulic grade that allowed the water to flow downhill by gravity, the people that put this structure together, the people that designed it, the people that engineered it, have saved people today a lot of money I in energy it. costs because we don't have to pump it up to move it through this mountain. This tunnel is not a round tunnel. It is not round, it's horseshoe shaped, gives us a little extra strength at the top, but it also allowed for the laying of tracks down in the bottom so that we could get the equipment in and get the rock and muck out and then the tracks were later removed. So there used to be tracks right there down were, here. There were tracks down here for construction. And this is interesting too, Louie. Listen, there's an echo here. Hello. Hello. Speaking of railroads, this tunnel is a little over 13 miles long. Between here and the Colorado River, we've actually got about a little over 90 miles of tunnel uh, that was done, again, during the Depression years with a, a workforce. And that represents more tunnels than all of the railroad tunnels in the United States. And the next time we turn on our water, we'll have a little bit more of an appreciation of where it comes from. Well, certainly if anyone in Metropolitan Water District Service Area, which extends all the way from uh, Ventura down to the Mexican border and out into Riverside and San Bernardino counties, this is one source of water. It traveled 220 miles, 230 miles to get here. It's got another uh, 10 or 20 miles to go before it reaches our terminal reservoir then it goes to treatment plants, then it goes into an internal distribution system, then it shows up at your house. 
getting water into Southern California is a complicated and difficult job. And I'll tell you, the people who built this tunnel back in the 30s are heroes, absolute yeah. heroes. Yeah, in a way, it's kind of poignant to think that this is exactly where they were working for so many years to and bring water to all of us today. And what we just did in about three hours took them about six years. You know, we did this program a couple of years ago, and the reaction to it has been pretty amazing, especially from people who have lived in the Palm Springs area all their lives and never knew there was a tunnel going underneath and through the mountain. The mountain, San Jacinto. It's such a part of life and living in the Coachella Valley. It literally dominates the landscape. I think it has almost a spiritual quality to it. And since I've moved to Palm Springs, I spend more and more time hiking this huge mountain. I also spend a lot of time looking at it from the pool in my backyard. But in the summertime, especially when it's over 100 on the desert floor, it's 30 to 40 degrees cooler on top and offers a refreshing escape. And part of the fun of getting up to the top of Mount San Jacinto is the ride up on the Palm Springs Aerial Tramway. And that's where we are. Wait a minute. What are you taking pictures of? <laughs> <laughs> I'm supposed to be filming you. You're no, not I supposed to pay it. <laughs> so where are you from? I'm from the UK. OK, now, are you all heading up for the first time? Yeah, we're not going down. So this is your first experience. <laughs> it is the first what time. What do you think so far? Well, it's great, isn't it? You don't have anything like this in England. Everything's bigger here, isn't it? <laughs> Absolutely. All right, now where are you all from? San Diego. San Diego. Is this your first trip up? No, we've been up several times before, but in uh, March. So you've been up when the snow was up on Exactly. We've done some snowshoeing, and this time we're hiking to the peak. Okay, now how long a hike is that going to be? It's 11 and a half miles round trip. Because I haven't gotten quite to the peak yet. That's not an easy hike. I've, I've done it before from the other side, which is a 15-mile round trip, but uh, we're doing the easy way this time to All right, break got, my daughter in for hiking. You've got plenty of water. Yeah. Plenty of bear repellent. No bears here. <laughs> you're right. You've been up before, you That's know. That's right. And you're excited about this. Yeah, it's great. It's really now, do people from England, do they hike once you get up there, or are you just going to kind of stand around and look? No, we haven't got our hiking gear with us. We couldn't fit it in the suitcase, so we're just going to have a look. All right, so I think that's part of it. Some people go up, whoa! That's when we hit the tower. That's great. <laughs> Let's talk to this lady right over here. Now, I know you were a regular. We were talking before we got on the tram today. That's correct. Yeah, I come up every other day. Every other day? In the summer, because you can't stay in the valley and hike. Yeah. Yeah, so I'm up here. I'm a birder. I look at birds, so I come up every other day and check it out. You know, I just started doing that this summer. It's an amazing place up here, isn't uh -huh. it? Wonderful, wonderful. About uh, 35 degrees cooler than the desert. Yeah, that's why we like it up there. Right. And look right. over here, Troy. Let's walk around. Let Troy walk around right here. This is part of the fun of it, is just the view. Look up here. This wonderful view of the mountain, it is just spectacular. Let me see if I can remember all the facts. The tramway was built in 1963. It's about two and a half miles long and rises about 6,000 feet. Look over here, Troy. We're getting ready to pass the other car as we go right up the side of this beautiful, beautiful mountain. Here, we can get a shot right here. They're waving at us out the windows. This is a very exciting ride all the way to the top of the mountain. And these are brand new cars that were put in uh, just this year, made in Switzerland. The floor revolves. And let's get one look down at the valley floor, because this is part of the, the fun of it, too, is as you rise up and the temperature gets cooler, you're looking down at the beautiful hot Coachella Valley down there. There's Palm Springs, that little green speck down there. We're heading to the top of the mountain in the tram. Good morning. Where are y'all hiking out from? We're up in a Round Valley today. Up at, That's where we're heading. It's very beautiful up there. We went up Monday and stayed up for a few days. So you camped out up here on top of the mountain. 
Yeah, it's the only place actually that there's water. So, first time you've ever done anything like this? No, nope, we've done it a number of years. Y'all are experienced hikers and campers. Mm -hmm. uh, I guess you could say that. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're carrying a pretty good load here. And that's our fourth year up here. You know, we're just turning people on to the fact that this is up here, this beautiful oh, state park that is like you would never know you right. were in the desert. Right. Normally we come up, we usually come up the Idlewild side and they sort of meet at the top there, but this year we decided to do a little something different. So. Okay, so you're heading back down. Now we just came up. Let me just give you the weather forecast. Oh, no. It's going to be about 104 down there today. Oh my gosh. You know what? It was uh, <laughs> went down to 50 at night yeah. and uh, it was really like very pleasant up there, about 70. Yeah. yeah. Very nice. All right. So it's going to be harsh. <laughs> have a good trip down. Thanks a lot. Thanks have a good trip down. <laughs> you, you all are from? Uh, West LA. West oh, so you all are city dwellers. City people just getting away for a couple days. And a great place it is to get yeah, away. It's beautiful. Nice okay. to meet you all. Thanks. Yeah. All right, Thank come you. on. We've got our little group here. Pat, this is kind of your routine. The routine is, is that we come up here to the ranger station and we have to fill out permits. Right, correct. We fill out the permits and there's two copies. One copy we take with us, one copy we leave in the box. When we return from Round Valley or wherever your hike is finished from, you do come right back here and there is a green mailbox down here where you drop off the second uh, part of the permit. And the permits are free. Exactly. You, and there is no limit to how many permits at the current time. You don't hear anything. You hear some birds and a little bit of the breeze. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it's, uh, it's good for your mental health. Yeah. And that's what's great about coming up here early in the morning. There were only four or five people on the tram. There's hardly anybody up here now. Now's the time to be up here. Exactly. And we're going to have a real nice quiet hike. All right, let's turn around and get a shot of where we came from because this is beautiful as well. Everywhere you look, you see these beautiful trees and the peace and tranquility of being on top of this mountain and our hike has just begun. Okay, we're filling out our permits here. We're at the ranger station. Here's the ranger himself. Introduce yourself to everybody, Eric. I'm Eric Hansen. Eric and I have become good friends this summer because I've been coming up here quite a bit. And do you remember the first day I came in you and bet. I was a little apprehensive about what I should do up here because I'm not really a hardcore hiker. Yeah, I remember that. You didn't even have water with you that particular time. <laughs> I've, got, I've got water right now. I bought my little water pack here. Yeah, that's great. Which leaks from time to time, and I just found out today what makes it leak. Yeah, there's a huge pressure difference when you come up the tram. Uh, your water bottles will do strange things. They'll leak coming up, and they'll capsize going the other direction. So when you come up with water bottles, you need to kind of unscrew them and let the pressure out. Yeah, you just have to watch that first drink. When you open it up, it can squirt you pretty good. Okay, Eric, we are on the trail, and I guess this is as good a time as any to explain officially exactly where we are. Well, he'll, we're entering the Mount San Jacinto State Wilderness. We're on the low trail. Uh, the backcountry up here is loaded with trails. Between the state and federal wilderness areas, we have approximately 70 miles of trail, and the state wilderness and state park combined is about 14,000 acres. And these trails, what I like about them, because I'm not a hardcore hiker, they're, they're pretty accessible. I mean, they're not trails that a beginner could navigate. Yeah, we have a variety. Uh, the one nice thing about up here is that the tram gives you such quick and easy access. It's a wonderful place for beginners to get into it. And it's not easy to get up here, is it? This is kind of out of the way. No, if you have to walk in from Idlewild, it's eight miles and a lot of uphill. And the other way is coming up the tram. There are no roads up here. No, it's a completely roadless area. It is a wilderness. Uh, you can actually start in Mexico or Canada and come here via the Pacific Crest Trail. We'll stick with the tram. Thank you I very so. much. I mean, the whole idea is to get up here and we were also talking coming up the trail about the percentages of people, hundreds of thousands of people come up the tram every year. What percentage of them do you think ever leave the building at the top of the tram and come out and take advantage of all this? 
Well, our best guess is that only between 30 and 40 percent of the people that ride the tram actually get out into Long Valley and onto our trails. Actually leave the building uh, at the top of the tram. Exactly. Uh, most people just come up for the meal or for the ride itself, and they never even get into this wonderful wilderness that's behind the building. Well, this is spectacular. What are we looking at right up on top up there? Well, there's basically two peaks we're looking at. The left peak is Gene Peak, and the right real rocky peak in front of us here, that's Yale Peak. We're not going up there. No. <laughs> We're going to Round Valley. I'm still in the beginning stage of my hiking, but I tell you what, when you walk along these trails, there's always, it seems like every day I'm up here, something new and wonderful to see that you missed the day before. Yeah, there's a lot to explore. Uh, we have a lot of people who come up here for years and still don't know the place. Lots of beautiful rock formations up here. Oh, you bet. Uh, along our east face, we have some walls that are over a thousand feet high. Really? You bet. And what an interesting combination between the trees and the rocks and the terrain here. Uh, what I've noticed is, is that when you're walking one direction, you see one thing, and then when you turn around and come back in the other direction, it has a whole nother look to it. Yeah, isn't it amazing how you just turn around 180 degrees and it's a whole new world. Now we're getting down into an interesting part down here where we can talk about the air because the air is thinner up here. You bet. Those oxygen molecules are a long way apart at this elevation. Which probably throws some people off the first time they're up here. You bet. We see a lot of people up here get altitude sickness just because they're not used to the rarefied air. In fact, you warned me about going too high up the first day. You bet. You want to acclimatize, take it slow. A lot of people need to drink lots of water because if, you're, if you don't have enough water, you're predisposed to altitude sickness. And what's also interesting about this air, it is literally cool and crisp and fresh and clean. You bet. Uh, it can be as much as 40 degrees difference between the valley floor where you left and where we're hiking now. And lots of times in the winter time, when it's 75 down on the valley floor and people are laying out by the pool and they say, oh, let's go up on the tram. They come up here, it's freezing, there's snow up you here. You bet, uh, we see that a lot in the spring and even in the early fall where it'll be hot down below, but people come up here and it'll be actually below freezing. The flatlanders, the tourists get taken uh, off guard. Yeah, it surprises a lot of folks. All right, let's just walk right out here I mean, it, 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 you know, I, we could stop almost anywhere to get the, the views that we're talking about. You know what I like to do? I like to, about halfway through the hike, I go off the trail and lay down on one of these flat rocks and take a nap and just yeah. listen to the wind going through the trees and listen to the birds singing, and I sleep like a baby. In Southern California, solitude is such a rare thing, and that's something that we, ha we really offer. Uh, solitude up here is tremendous. It's a chance for you to get away from the hustle and bustle of everyday life down below. And yet, I think this place is still kind of a secret. Yeah, uh, a lot of people are surprised that there is such a wilderness setting in Southern California. And uh, like I say, very rarely do they get past the tram building. I like the dead trees. Yeah, uh, we leave those go down for a couple of reasons. First is it provides habitat for our animals and our wildlife. The second is that it also provides the beginnings of soil. That's where decomposition takes place. Mm -hmm. So this is the natural way of doing it. And here again is one of these beautiful views. You know, just everywhere you look, you look back here where we just came from at the rocks and the trees, you get a beautiful 360 of this whole place. If we weren't filming today, I'd be taking my break right now and just going over and laying on that rock. <laughs> Taking a nap. Here they come, coming down the trail. Where are you all headed? Headed, headed up to, uh, where is it? You've been here. Round no, Valley. Round, Round Valley. Valley. Yeah. Round Valley. Now, what's the occasion? Well, my daughter thought that uh, she'd take me out on my birthday to, uh, to give me a little workout. She also, said, today is your birthday. Today is my birthday. <laughs> she said it would do me good. Yeah. <laughs> what do you mean by that? Well, 
it's just a nice day to be out in the, in the open. <laughs> How about if I leave it at that? You all are from? <laughs> Los Angeles. Oh, so you've come from the city to this glorious yeah. mountain town. He needed fresh air. Yeah. You see? So <laughs> Have you been here before? I've been here before a number of times, usually backpacking, but now I got her with the backpack. Oh, so so she, well, it's your birthday. Yes, my birthday. You're supposed to carry the pack. This is wonderful. Well, That's happy wonderful. birthday. Thank Enjoy the fresh air. Yes. Thank you. It's, it's just nice. glorious up here. You, you just can't beat it. I think Southern California, anywhere in the world, this is, this is the place to be. Who takes care of all these trails? Well, my staff does most of the work. Uh, state Park System employs a seasonal staff and they maintain all the trails within our state park and wilderness. Because these are great trails. Are these, are some of these originally Indian trails? Yeah, originally uh, Indian trails were used and then the CCCs in the 30s uh, proceeded to uh, go over a lot of those trails then actually improve and maintain them. And uh, we ended up with the trail system we have today. Boy, this is just beautiful. You know, I've. The first time I was hiking it, I, I just was, oh, wait a minute, this is the rock. This is where I usually take my nap, <laughs> right here under this tree, just looking up in the tree and listening to the birds and to the wind. Yeah, we got a lot of birds up here. I don't hear any this morning. Well, actually, they're most active in the morning and evening. So if you want to experience our wildlife in general, you need to be here on the first car, get out here early and, or come up late uh, just before dusk yeah okay let's walk right down here because here's another one of these great views and you know these trails are basically easy trails too yeah most of our uh, trail system is easy to moderate and uh, like I said it's great for beginners because it doesn't stress you too bad so somebody could actually start out and not have to really have a destination in mind they could just walk as far as they wanted to walk and, and then turn around and go back. You bet. Uh, a lot of people come up here for the first time are a little concerned and they ask me what to do. And I said, walk till you're not having fun anymore and turn around and come back. <laughs> All right, we're still having fun, so let's you keep bet. walking. Oh, we got some people on the trail. Hi, huh? how you doing? Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. You're what? Hi, heading back to civilization. <laughs> <laughs> Where have you all been? Oh, wow, that's up over 10,000 feet yeah, up. Yeah, 10,804, I think. Yeah. Yeah. How long did it take you to get up there? <sighs> well, we hiked well, in the Round Valley yeah. and camped overnight. And uh -huh. then then yesterday we took, what is it, six hours up and back, something like that? Yeah, about what, three and a half to the top. Two five to get up to the top from when we started. Now, you all are experienced hikers. They, oh, very. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, we, did yeah, this 30 years. we did this 30 years ago, though. What? And not, not too much in between. Yeah. The, the, these two guys are my sons, and this is my daughter-in-law. We hiked to the top 30 years ago. So this is your first time back? Since. Yeah. Wow, how'd the old man hold up? He did great. <laughs> he did great. <laughs> I didn't make the top this time, but I got pretty close. You got to Round Valley. And, oh, and a yeah, bit and then a little bit further. Oh, right. Wow, this is what a great way for the family. Is, this to, is her maiden voyage yeah. in the hiking world. And so, so this we, was a bonding experience yeah. with the yeah. family. He's been right? wanting to take me for 12 years. I wish I had gone 10 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> really? Oh, well, it's really strenuous for somebody yeah. that's never done Yeah, this. but I tell we're you what, we're just talking about it with the ranger. This place grows on you because oh, it is oh, a magical it's place. It's beautiful. It's, it's, I mean, the view from up there is just like nothing I've ever seen. Yeah. It's, that was the payoff, but my two words for this trip have been exhilaration and misery. <laughs> right now we're in the misery portion. Why? It's all downhill. <laughs> You're heading downhill. Right. I still got 30 pounds on my back. <laughs> well, have fun. Let's get everybody together. Stand here for a group picture. What's the name of this family? Franz. The Franz yeah. family, introduced by name. Judy Franz. Norm Franz. Robert Franz. Randy Franz. From? Uh, Orange County. Orange no, County, Placentia, uh, and Irvine. they live in Irvine, and he lives in Brea. Great. Let's get a nice group picture. <laughs> They're in their misery phase right now, but they still look happy. Soon to be home, though. So, soon to be home from yeah, the top well, of Mount well, San Jacinto. Well, yeah. Nice Great. to meet you all. Nice to meet you, too. Thank you. <laughs> Eric, I'm just thinking back to that first day we met up here, the first time that yeah. I came up here. Yeah. Uh, I remember it too. <laughs> Why are you laughing? Well, uh, here's a guy in tennis shoes, no socks, no water, and no pack. I just came up here curious about what was here. I left the tram building for the first time and kind of ventured out. And you kind of 
set me off on my way with words of encouragement. You loaned me a bottle of water, told me to next time get some good shoes and socks. But I think that's part of it, isn't it? People have to, who are not great hikers, who are not experienced hikers, maybe they have a fear of the unknown. They're not real sure of themselves, so they don't try. Sure, new things scare us. Uh, it takes a little experience, but sometimes it takes just a nudge to get them out the door and they discover a whole new world. So you could encourage people to come up who aren't experienced hikers and they could still enjoy this. You bet, this is a place to get experience and we have trails from easy to hard and we just start out easy and get people used to it and people find out they fall in love with hiking in the wilderness. Hey boys, what's it like up there on top of the rock? Well, it's real nice and sunny and uh, you can whole... see all, all the pine trees and Beautiful view from up here. <laughs> it's a beautiful view from up here. Those your kids? Yeah, they're my boys. Now, do you all come up here a lot? About two or three times a year. So this is their, their old timers at this. Yeah, they've been backpacking since they were four and six years old. Really? Mm -hmm. So you feel safe letting them yeah. go up there? Yeah, they're experienced. They like to climb around. They like to climb, uh, climb and jack around, yeah. And what's he doing with his binoculars? What are you looking at up there? Um. Just checking out the scenery and stuff. Just checking out the scenery. Yeah. Now, do they go home with all kind of great adventure stories? Yeah, we bring a camera and we tell ghost stories at night and uh, it's just a blast. He knew, he was telling us how high up we are. How high up are we? 8,500 feet. 8,000, they know That's their right. facts. That's right, they do. <laughs> it's because I make them look at the topo maps before we leave home. <laughs> <laughs> now, here's a guy what do you call this that you're doing right here? I'm just power walking. Power walking? Yeah. Are right. you up here power walking a lot? Oh, a couple times a week. Yeah. Really? Yes. When did mm. you get started doing that? Well, uh, in July of this year. I did it two years ago, and then last year the tram was closed, so I didn't get an annual pass. But. So you come up when it's hot down in the valley, you come up here? Exactly, right. And you do how many miles a day do you figure well, you do? anywhere to Wellman's Divide, which is six miles to the peak. And, and uh, do you go? Solid the whole way through? Well, I'll stop at Wellman's Divide usually. Yeah. And, uh, went by myself and then at the top. But yeah. you're not out of breath. Uh, sometimes, yeah. <laughs> See, that's why we stopped to talk to you for a minute. We wanted to give you a chance to catch your breath. Well, I appreciate it. Your name is? Don Renneker. And if people come up here, they can see you up here twice a week. That's right. Usually on Mondays and Wednesdays or either Wednesdays and Fridays. Right, yeah. Power walking. Yeah. That's great. It's good exercise. Keeps me young. Good morning, gentlemen. Hi there. How you doing? I'm Huel Hauser. I'm Eric. Nice to meet you. Hi, Huel. I'm Mark. Nice to meet you. Good morning. What's your story? We're stopping people on the trail. Well, um, just wanted to get my boy out here and enjoy the top of the hill today. Uh huh. Been waiting for a pretty day to do that, and it's a beautiful day. Now, so. are you all locals? Yeah, we live just uh, down the mountain over in Wildemar. Uh -huh. uh, it's just maybe about an hour's drive from here, not too so far away. So you know the beauty and the wonder of coming up oh, here and absolutely. hiking. Absolutely, yeah, we you love it. You ever been up here before? No, this is my first time. Really? I like, I like it so far. How far are you taking him? We're gonna try and go to the summit. Oh my gosh. Yeah, we're at least gonna go to Wellman's Divide and, and then if, if time permits, we're gonna go on up to the summit today. Is he in good enough shape to do I that? I think so, yeah. Are you in good enough shape to do I that? I would hope so, yeah. <laughs> We've met a lot of very interesting people on oh, the trail today. You meet some nice folks up here hiking. It's, you know, that's part of it, yeah, too. Yeah, it really is. We've met folks from all around. You get up here, and people sometimes are from out of state, out of the country, and then sometimes you find out it's your neighbor that's just down the street from you, so it's neat. Yeah, you know, that's something we kind of forgot to talk about, and that's all the nice people that you meet oh, along yeah. the way. I have met some amazing people this summer. We see a phenomenal amount of visitors from out of the area, uh, international visitors, people from all over the U.S., and a lot of nice folks. They're all nice people, and, and along the trail, people take the time to stop and talk. Sure, a lot of folks like to chat. Uh, my job is great because I get to just talk to people all day. And you know what? A lot of people like to stop and chat because it gives them time to catch their breath. <laughs> the higher up you go, that's true. A lot of talking going on. That's Absolutely. right. Take All right, gentlemen, head on out. All right. Thank you. Nice, nice to meet you. Meet you.
And where did you come from? Well, I'm a volunteer here in the State Park. Uh -huh. I belong to an organization, it's a Natural History Association, and we sort of uh, help out the, uh, the park a little bit by uh, running a visitor center, ah. doing nature walks. I've been to your visitor center. And, uh, I haven't been on one of your nature walks. Yet. Well, you should come sometime. It's so on people weekend. can come to the top of the tram and take a short, it's not a long nature walk. No, Anybody can do it. Anybody can do it. It's about uh, two thirds of a mile. It goes around a meadow. And then we have uh, people that can explain what the, about the trees and the birds and the flowers when they're in season. How much fun for you. It's wonderful. It's wonderful. Boy, Eric, we couldn't have had a more beautiful day for our hike, but I get the feeling that just about every day is a beautiful day up here on top of this mountain. Well, we have a lot of beautiful days, but they're not all beautiful. I tell you, in the wintertime, it can get a little rough up here. Well, but that's part of the mountain, too. That's part of the wilderness experience. Well, that's what's so interesting about this, is it's so close to cities and towns and peoples and freeways and traffic and noise and pollution, we're up in the middle of a place like this. Yeah, we're literally an island of wilderness surrounded by civilization. Well, it's just wonderful up here. I am so thankful that I have been turned on to this place. You know I'm a regular up here, you bet. and I'll continue to come up here all year round. I'm even gonna try it out in the winter. I hope you Strap on those snowshoes. Yeah, snowshoeing, I can see you doing that. Which is a lot of fun too. You bet. Thanks for the tour. My pleasure. We're sending Eric back to the ranger station to make sure everybody is filling out their permit correctly. <laughs> yeah. By the way, we forgot to fill out our permit. Well, we figured we'd escort you. <laughs> okay. We're not going to get any trouble without it going on? No, I've let the staff know you're coming. Okay, good. Thanks a lot. My pleasure. Thank Take you care. very much. We're going to head on up to Round Valley. It's about three miles from here, and a beautiful three-mile hike it is. This whole place, the San Jacinto State Park and State Wilderness is just a magnificent place. I highly recommend it for you. You don't have to be a great hiker. You just have to enjoy the beauty and the solitude of what this place has to offer. It is a wonderful treasure, and the beauty of it all is that it belongs to all of us. The Palm Springs Desert Resorts Convention and Visitors Authority is a proud sponsor of Yule Hauser's annual look into the wonders of the Palm Springs area. From horseback riding through the Indian Canyons to hot air ballooning in the clear desert sky, there are lots of things to do. Further information is available at 1-800-41-RELAX or palmspringsusa.com. Whether it's enjoying family attractions or simply lying in the sun by the pool, the Palm Springs Desert Resort is the place to recharge your batteries and come back to life. Hello everybody, I'm Huell Hauser, and if you enjoyed this particular episode from our series saluting Palm Springs and the entire Coachella Valley, and would like to see it again or share it with family and friends, it's available on video cassette. All you have to do is call 1-800-266-5727 and we'll be glad to send it to you right away.